Good afternoon, everybody, from uh, from myself and on behalf of the HSC. Uh, I'm a principal ergonomist um, in the laboratories up in the science division, and um, I've been looking at musculoskeletal disorders now for now on 20 years, and was involved back in 2004 with the advent of the first version of the Mac tool. And it's a pleasure to be here with you. It's a pleasure that the tool itself is still going strong and has come so very far. And, and this is obviously the latest iteration um, of the well-established Mac tool and the wrap and the art as well. And it's something that we are genuinely very excited about, I think, as safety managers such as yourselves and people responsible, keeping these issues like musculoskeletal disorders at the top and the forefront of people's thinking when we do appreciate there's an awful lot of other stuff going on, especially at the moment. Um, it can be quite difficult and tools like this, not only do they simplify the risk assessment process and speed it up and make it easy for you, but they do re-energize people's thinking on, in the areas of musculoskeletal disorders in this case. And so it is a pleasure to be here and thanks for your time. Now, Carl's going to be controlling these slides for me, so thanks, Carl. So why are we bothered about musculoskeletal, musculoskeletal disorders or MSDs? Why is it such a big deal and why have we been going on about this since, you know, around 78 years ago was the first time it was mentioned in a document with the, uh, uh, with the precursor kind of organisations to HSE. It's not a new issue and yet still you get us and our inspector colleagues talking about it. There are three key reasons why MSDs are a big deal. And the first of those is the legal arguments. And of course, one of those is compliance against the regulations such as manual handling operations regulations and the like. We do have a legal duty of care and we do need to comply with the minimum level of, uh, uh, of operational minimum standard. But the other side of that is, of course, litigation and, and, and those claims mitigations, looking at managing and controlling claims when they do come in post incident or post injury. And one of the key areas or key failings we know from not our work in HSC, but work in, in colleague organizations um, such as insurers, one of the key problems that they see in terms of claims mitigation is failure to risk assess or failure to communicate those risk assessments. And at the front and center of, of these online tools that have been developed by TSO Books, um, that communication and that management of information and also the assessment themselves are much more readily available and much simpler to do in, in a far better format that will enable you to collate information, do assessments and communicate the outcomes. And so we do hope that it will certainly help you with the, the management of those legal issues that make MSD such a big deal. The next one is the moral argument. And of course, it, it almost goes without explanation, but none of us would want to knowingly injure any of our colleagues we want our colleagues to go home as healthy as they arrived in, in any one day of work. And of course, there's a moral issue of those of us who have suffered musculoskeletal disorders, it's never a good experience. And especially where those uh, aches and pains that we do take on uh, through life experiences and often uh, work as well as non-work related experiences, where they do affect our sleep, there's a very strong link between the ache and pain you may have in your back, for example, and then things like depression, anxiety, uh, and, and those mental disorders or mental health issues, especially where sleep's affected and also being off work for periods of time, as we'll mention in a second. We do lose all the crack with our friends, all that social uh, investment we make with our colleagues and friends at work, all that social reflection back upon us. And effectively, we suffer from being at home with daytime TV for company. And finally, the financial argument, something that in HSC, we've not really, I would argue, not done enough on over the last 10 years. We've been picking up the pace on the financial argument, but we have to acknowledge that with any risk uh, management system, but certainly with musculoskeletal disorders, we are getting a decent return on investment. It's worthwhile making those uh, investments in assessing and managing risk and then reducing risk through the purchase or hire of equipment and kit or changing operations. What we should always be looking for is that return on that initial investment, which makes the second investment much more justifiable and much more easier to take to senior leadership teams or financial directors to get them to sign those checks. And so we'll focus on that a little bit more as we go through these 10 minutes of my presentation. Thanks, Carl. 
So over the years, the musculoskeletal disorder prevalence has been going down. The line on a the graph there shows the prevalence rates uh, over nearly the last 20 years. And of course, this year, 2019-20, we don't really know the impact of anything because of COVID and so many of us were out of the workplace for so long. But what you can see there is a line and that line is gradually going down, which is a significant shift from where we were certainly 2001 two and 2002-3. There are a few blips on that line though and the most recent years you can see the line starts to go up. In fact over the last five years or so it, it's very much stagnated and we've not been seeing that gradual uh, decrease. Back in 2011 and 12 it was just post Bunsfield actually where HSC were tasked with not looking at health anymore but looking at high hazard industries like the petrochemical sector. So we stopped pushing tools and stopped trying to promote these tools and, and these uh, methods of risk assessment and control. And unsurprisingly, when we stopped pushing them, people used them less and we do see increases of uh, in prevalence rates of injury to self-reported systems. And so what we know from the graphs like this and from quite a large amount of data is that these interventions, especially the risk assessments, are effective and they're much, much more effective than, say, for example, getting in manual handling trainers to come and help you resolve uh, prevalence of, high prevalence of the back pain. The way to reduce those uh, prevalence rates, the way to get this graph going down on a national scale or the same within your organisations is to assess the risk and then act on those risk assessment outcomes to you know, coordinate those response to them to reduce those risks. And so we do have the data to demonstrate this stuff works. And um, there's an element of trust us, it does, but trust us because we've got the data to demonstrate it, it, it does work, is the key message there. Thanks, Carl. So just on the financial considerations, um, we're not going to uh, 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 go on about this for too long, but there are a few key points that are worth uh, making a note of. First and foremost, musculoskeletal disorders are a risk factor in all occupations. There are some where we see a higher prevalence, like construction, for example, and farming um, and distribution as well, but they are a risk factor in every single occupational sector and they cost a fortune. One of the, re and it results in about 30% of all days lost in 2018, 2019, just a few percentage points, fewer than a stress, depression, anxiety disorder, but certainly one of the key health issues. A couple of reasons why they resulting so many days lost and resulting so much money being lost is the third bullet point on this slide. On average per incidence people take 14 days off work whenever they get a bad back or an upper limb disorder. Now obviously this is skewed all over the place. Some people will often return to work in a couple of days whereas some will take six months off, God forbid. But if we take that average just as a, as a decent measure if you think about 14 days off, I'll be honest, I came back after 10 days off holidays on Monday and I had a great time, thanks for asking. Normally we'd be on a sun lounger somewhere, maybe by a pool smelling of some coconut sun cream or something. Unfortunately, when we're taking work, time off work with an ill health issue, that's not what we're talking about. There's no San Miguel involved and no trying to get first to the uh, sun loungers by the pool it's actually probably a, a missed night's sleep because of some pain of motion while you're in bed and then daytime television to keep you company instead of all your colleagues and all your friends, perhaps on reduced pay or no pay and every movement you make is partially discomforting but also a bit scary because you're worried about those tweaks and sudden onset pain. So it's a very, very difficult period of time where your support network is because you're not in work where you'd normally get those they drop off as well. And that link between um, stress, depression, anxiety disorder is really quite strong. And the resulting cost for the employer, there's a number of ways of cutting the costs. So just for the employer, per instance, each health issue costs on average 8,300 pounds. Now it costs a lot more than that for societal costs. If you, if you also uh, include things like GP costs and prescription costs and loss of earnings for the individuals and so forth. But just for the organization itself, the average cost per instance is £8,300. And the reason I'm emphasizing that is when you start to think about whether it's worth investing in doing some assessments and the time that that takes, then communicating those assessments and the time that that might take, and then 
actually intervening and changing the work processes or getting in the lifting aids and so on. Start thinking in terms of not just the cost of those interventions, but then also the savings of reducing incidents. And if the average cost per incident is £8,300, you don't have to reduce too many incidents on each task, one, maybe two a year, before you've just saved yourself £16,000, suddenly the cost of interventions doesn't seem quite so much. And one of the things that this online uh, version of the tools does, uh, does very well, is it does speed up the uh, risk assessment process and speeds up the risk uh, communication process that happens after that. It does make it actually faster uh, and much more available to more people. And so we think that the actual cost of intervention will come down whereas the cost of an incident sadly will probably go up over time. So the return on investment is definitely stacking up in our favour. It's well worth being proactive with our risk management for musculoskeletal disorders. Thanks, Carl. The way it costs you are going to be manifold and very, very individual to each organisation. Um, there are lots of models on our website in hsc.gov.uk, lots of models of how MSDs cost uh, organisations and society but they will be very individual to you. So we don't want to go on too much about that. It is well worth considering these though, and it'll be a fag packet calculation or back of an envelope calculation at best. Even the very good tools that enable you to do this are still uh, indicative and still estimations. But it is worth thinking about how you as an organization would lose when people do go off uh, on sick and substance because of musculoskeletal disorder. Uh, to enable you to just take those discussions to senior leaders and whoever it is who has the, uh, the checkbook in your organisation. Thanks, Carl. And so how do we manage MSDs? Well, I'm sure you've seen this before at some point. Um, this is a very simple process. We identify the rubbish jobs. And how do we identify rubbish jobs? Those higher risk jobs are a bit more likely to create an injury. Well, the very best way of doing that is through engagement with the workforce on your walkabouts and when you are engaging with the, uh, the workforce and getting yourself seen on the, on the operational lines or where the work's being done, have a chat with the workforce and colleagues and ask them, what do they find strenuous? What's their worst part of the job? Which part of this operation do they least prefer and why? And that's a really good way of actually identifying those high risk activities. Once you've identified them, try and avoid them if you can. Um, often mechanization or automation will help with that, but often it's a little bit out of reach, to be honest. It can be quite expensive. And so if we can't avoid those high risk jobs, we don't panic, we don't worry. We're obliged though to assess the risk. And this is where um, uh, we actually understand how much, what are the levels of risk? Is it a significant amount of risk? And what kind of emphasis do we need to put in the controls against the risk? So we identify the jobs, we try and avoid them if we can't, uh, where we can. If we can't, we then assess the jobs and we assess in order to reduce the job, re reduce the risk. Either reduce the risk or eliminate the risk if possible, but we don't have to eliminate all risk and you'll not succeed, unfortunately. Um, when we're not there anymore, you're already smart, you, all, you already have elimination in place and reduction in place as well as you can. And so you shouldn't expect to find a silver bullet that does everything for you. Mechanization or automation is very, very expensive still, and it isn't always the best solution. So we do have to sometimes acknowledge to our assessments, we have some risk, but we have to live with it. There's nothing we can do. It's too expensive to design out of the operation. And so that rest, risk then needs managing. And that's the last point here. If we manage residual risk. That's where we get our training in especially manual handling training, that's where we use it. Once all this risk management process has taken place, trainers will come in and mop up the residual risk by teaching our operators and our colleagues how to do those higher risk jobs more safely, making them aware of any uh, safe op operating procedures and making them aware of any you know, mitigation in terms of their own behaviors they can do. And often that falls down to posture, which isn't effective in most cases, but it is a requirement. Uh, for manual handling training especially. We can also use uh, leading indicators as well, things like health surveys or just a regular frequent chat with our colleagues who are exposed to risk, how they're doing, how's their back, how's their arms, um, and, and bring that up to the forefront. But the reason I'm showing you all that, the, the five stages of MST risk management, 
is to just really demonstrate that the cornerstone of all this, the pivotal moment, the thing you'll spend the most time doing are these assessments, these risk assessments of individual tasks that uh, people undertake in your workplaces. That takes more time, that take, gives you much more detail and knowledge and understanding of where the risks are and which the tasks need a, a prioritizing and that's where these tools will help specifically. They will cut down that assessment time, they'll make the assessments easier and probably actually more accurate as well. The HSC tools that we're, we've included in, the, in, in these uh, online tools um, are very accurate. The research has been done, got a very good evidence base. And so it should be unusually quite quick and quite accurate and very communicable at the end. So you can share those results. Thanks, Carl. And so finally, the question is which tools have we used or which tools have we included? It's, if you're familiar with them, it's the Mac tool, the RAP tool, and the ART tool. Mac tool for back pain, because that's about 40% of injuries in the lower back. And also the RAP tool for back pain. And then finally, the ART tool, the upper assessment of repetitive tasks or upper limb disorders assessment. Again, about 40 to 41% of, of musculoskeletal disorders are upper limbs. So with the MAC, the RAP and the ART included, that covers about 80% of the common areas where we get musculoskeletal disorders. We've not included lower limbs yet. We don't have a very good tool for assessing lower limb injury. And the data that we have from RIDOR and Labour Force Survey is a little bit different with lower limbs. Yes, a lower limb uh, injury might have been a, uh, a musculoskeletal cumulative disorder from stepping up and down stairs, for example, but it could be a strained ankle from tripping and slipping or from kneeling on something sharp, it could be a puncture wound. So we've not covered lower limbs in these tools. We're covering the, the main areas of risk, which are the back and the upper limbs. <laughs> 